Hey, welcome back. I've got something super, super cool to show everyone today. We all know Alienware has had some heat buildup issues for as long as they've been making computers. However, the new Alienware Aurora R13 and R14 finally have enough room in the case for us to do something about it because I've successfully fixed Alienware CPU temperature throttling problem. If you have watched my previous videos on this computer, you'll know it has a Core i7 with just a little baby heatsink fan like you would find in most Dell workstation PCs. Obviously that is not going to cut it whatsoever. I personally don't know why it even would be an option for a gaming computer, but that's a whole other video. And even if you do have Alienware's liquid cooler with an i7 that you've overclocked, or an i9, you're going to run into the same issue under a long CPU load. And this video will show you what you need to do to remedy this problem. So if you have one of these issues, stick around and you'll find out how you can fix yours too. I'll leave a link in the description for everything I used for this video. But before we get right into it, I want to show you some thermal benchmarks from the computer before I installed the new AIO cooler. For this test, I'm going to start using just the CPU stress test because I didn't think it could handle the extra heat from the GPU as well, and I was right. Also something to note during this test, the computer got super loud like a jet engine to try and overcompensate for the CPU temperature. It doesn't take long at all before those CPU temperatures start skyrocketing, less than 10 seconds, and we're already seeing temps above 90 degrees Celsius on some of the sensors. Not much longer after that, and adding the GPU test as well, and we start seeing red numbers and the CPU usage dropping and becoming almost totally reliant on the GPU due to it making too much heat and not being able to get rid of it. This is what is called thermal throttling and it does have a good reason to do this so you don't destroy your CPU but with a computer price that starts at over $1500 for the cheapest model it's just unacceptable. Let's get into the actual installation. I've got all my ESD wrist strap and I have all my stuff laid out ready to go so let's get started disconnecting the CPU fan and the back fan so we can get that junk out of there. Once we're disconnected, take this screw out holding the fan bracket in place. It's kind of crazy the stuff they come up with to make modern sized computer fans fit in the case that only has mounting holes for a 92mm fan, but don't even get me started on that. Because of this though, we are going to reuse the existing bracket for our new cooler. Go ahead and pull out the little black rubber pins holding the fan in the bracket and let's grab our replacement fan making sure it's orientated so that the power cord on the, is on the back side so you won't see it in the case and the arrow on the fan is pointing back so it's pulling air out. Then if you haven't already go ahead and dump out your screws and mounting hardware from Corsair and find the long screws. We're going to use these to mount the radiator to the bracket with the screws going through the back of the fan. Now technically we could use the old fan in this bracket, but it's really not the fan for the job. Most case fans work great for providing airflow into and out of the case, but in the case of this radiator we want a fan with high static pressure. That way it really grabs the air and pull it through the tight radiator coils. It's also a magnetic bearing fan so it works a lot better by spinning with less resistance and also not being as loud as the stock fan would be under high RPMs. Now that you have the radiator mounted directly through the back of the fan to the bracket, you may be wondering why there's still an extra fan sitting on the table. And no, it's not to upgrade one of the case fans. Yet. That will be coming in a later video. But no, this is actually the secret to the Alienware heating issue. We're going to be using two fans instead of just one to keep the CPU and radiator cool by using a push and pull configuration instead of just pushing or pulling. This is going to allow for greater airflow and temperature regulation in a 120mm AIO cooler since we can't use something like a 240mm cooler like this powerful of a computer really needs. For those of you that already have the Alienware's liquid cooler, this is the easy upgrade that you're going to want to do to get the same results, unless you just want to replace the entire cooling system altogether, but that's your call, not mine. Now that we have our new cooler ready to install, it's time to remove the old heatsink cooler. If you can call it that, it didn't really keep it that cool. Make sure when removing to unscrew the four corners a little at a time and on each screw to not apply too much uneven pressure to the CPU and accidentally damage it. Next step is to clean off the old thermal paste since the pump head comes with new pre-applied thermal paste 
There's really no right or wrong way to do this, but I just came in with a paper towel to get up as much as I could, and then came back with cotton swabs dipped in isopropyl alcohol to clean the rest up and get in the crevices. Now that our CPU is clean and ready, it's time for our mounting hardware. Alienware comes with a pre-installed mounting bracket on the back of the motherboard, so you don't need the Corsair retention bracket at all. The standoff screws work just fine in the pre-existing bracket, and it saves you from having to take the whole motherboard out the computer to install the new one. However, since this is a 12th gen Intel processor, we do need the LGA1700 standoff screws for an Intel processor, which, as of right now, don't come standard in the Corsair mounting kit. The older style standoffs might work if you don't screw them in all the way, but I wanted to make sure I did it right, so I bought them from the Corsair website for like seven bucks, and I would recommend you do the same. We are finally ready to install the cooler. After a quick check to make sure the holes all lined up on the pump head, we're going to line up our specialized Dell mounting bracket and slide it into place. Set aside the pump in a spot it's not going to fall or damage anything in the computer, and go ahead and put that screw back in from earlier. I played around with the hoses for a while, trying to get the pump to sit the right way, but it was just too close to the radiator in this computer and the tubes wouldn't sit correctly. This is the best configuration I found. The tubes weren't in any bind and they didn't push on the GPU or the RAM, so I was fine with it. I also don't have the clear side panel anyway, so it didn't really matter to me whatsoever as long as it's set up the best way possible. Also very important, if you didn't set up the radiator like I did and had the tubes coming out the top, please go back and do it like this so the tubes come out the bottom. It is very important because there is air in these systems and over time, as the liquid dissipates inside more and more, the pump will become starved for water and burn up prematurely, as well as not keeping your CPU cool. As we all know, water is heavier than air, so placing the tubes at the bottom of the loop provides a place at the top of the radiator for air to pull, that way it stays out of the pump head. This will ensure the longest lifespan out of your AIO cooler. I actually picked this specific cooler for a reason, because it runs off a SATA power connector, and with Dell's proprietary ways, I knew it would at least have that handy. I had originally bought a fan power splitter, so both fans would always be running at the same RPMs, but I was actually surprised by Corsair when I noticed this cooler already had two fan power cables, so I ended up not needing it. I ran the fan power under the radiator for a cleaner look, and made the connections on top, where they're not super noticeable, but still easily accessible in the future. As for the SATA power cord, I ran it through the cord loop running at the top of the motherboard and connected the SATA power cord inside the 3.5 inch hard disk tray after I took out the blue mounting bracket. This wasn't really necessary, but I wanted to since I'll never put a hard disk drive in this computer. The last connection to be made is going to connect to the CPU fan header and not the CPU pump. It specifically said to use this connection rather than the latter inside the Corsair manual, so I just went with what the expert said and it ended up working out perfectly. Earlier when I said I picked this cooler for a reason, I really did, because if you've noticed at the front of the computer where the two intake fans are, there is technically room for a 240mm radiator. I want to reference a video made by Gamers Nexus titled Fixing the Alienware R13 Dumpster Fire, where they attempt this and almost successfully I should add. Let me explain. In that video, they actually do succeed in getting it to fit, however they ended up creating more problems in the long run because a cooler that size is going to create more heat, and having it at the front of the PC just throws that heat on all your other components in a PC case that is already starved for cool air. Plus, Dell's proprietary motherboard doesn't have the connections for it to work properly with no BIOS errors. I want to give them credit though for actually trying as that is literally the only video I found where someone even tried to fix these issues instead of just accepting that it is what it is and moving on. So hats off to them and I'll leave a link to their video in the description. Go check it out when you get a chance, I really enjoyed it. Just like in that video there is one drawback from this cooler. We can't use the USB cord for this cooler which allows you to adjust the RGB lighting inside the Corsair IQ software so it is stuck in the default rainbow swirling color effect. It might be a deal breaker for some, but again, I don't have the clear side panel, so I can't see the color inside anyway. Quick little cable management view. I've got my two fan connections made at the top of the PC case, I've got my SATA power connector plugged in, and I have my CPU fan ready to go. First power on test goes perfectly, 
as you can see all the fans spin up just as planned and the RGB lighting works just fine without that USB connector. Also the computer booted normally with no BIOS error messages. Now for the results of all our hard work. Time to see if it actually made a difference. We're going to run a test using both the CPU and GPU under full load. I'm going to speed up the video to give you real time test footage but even with 100% CPU usage under which normal circumstances you would never actually use the computer stays around 70 degrees celsius which is well within the safe operating temp and far better than where we started. Something to note so you don't worry later on is if you go into the Alienware control center the CPU fan reading will always show 100% even under no load when they are really barely spinning at all. This is to be expected since the fans are not directly plugged into the motherboard so just something to be aware of. Thank you all for watching. I'll leave links in the description to everything I use for this video and hopefully you too can solve your Alienware heating problems. I'll catch you in the next video.